This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Hey everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you're tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists get funding, gain influence, and build strategic relationships with the stakeholders who matter most in their professional world. Reaching those goals often involves effective translation of complicated research into engaging jargon-free communication that boils down complex topics to capture the attention of decision makers and general audiences. Interested in getting a free resource to help you do just that? Go to complexitymadeclear.com to get the 11 keys for translating complexity. That's complexitymadeclear.com to get your free infographic used by science communicators and others at major organizations to boil down, never dumb down, complicated science and technical topics for key stakeholders. I am so pleased to welcome Patrick Mullane to the show today. Patrick is the Executive Director of Harvard Business School Online and Harvard Business School Executive Education, where he manages all non-degree offerings. He brings over 20 years of management experience across several industries to the position. As Executive Director, he is responsible for managing HBS Online's and HBS Executive Education's growth, expansion in global markets, and long-term success. Prior to joining HBS, Patrick was the CEO of Fabrico, Inc., an industrial manufacturing company that was purchased by Technetics, Inc. in 2014. Subsequent to the sale of Fabrico, he served as vice president and general manager of Technetics Industrial Turbine Portfolio. Before earning his MBA, Patrick served as a captain in the U.S. Air Force Intelligence Organization. He has also been an early employee of a technology startup, managed Kaplan Test Prep and Admissions Washington, D.C. market, and worked for a telecommunications equipment company. Patrick holds a B.S. in mathematics from the University of Notre Dame, an M.S. in project and systems management from Golden Gate University, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Welcome to the show, Patrick. It is wonderful to have you here. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. Appreciate the invite. Your excellent book, which is called The Father, Son, and the Holy Shuttle, gives readers a window into your life growing up as a son of an astronaut, Mike Mullane, who was chosen in the very first group of space shuttle astronauts, a group that included Sally Ride. Can you give listeners a sense of what it was like growing up in that environment? Maybe a story or two that you could share about that. And also, what themes would you like readers to take away from your book? Sure. As the title implies, and as you summarize there, it's a memoir about growing up with a father who was doing a very interesting thing and a very intimidating thing at times and a very dangerous thing kind of all the time. And so it has a number of stories that explain hopefully through humor and through suspense what it was like to live that life. And I think that a lot of people, certainly if you ask them, do the astronauts have families? People are going to know, of course they do, but I don't think people really internalize what it's like for the families of people who do things, test flying and flying into space. They're obviously flying into space in particular is a very unique thing, not many people in the world still can say they've done that. And so not many families can say that they've had to deal with what that's like to see a loved one go into space. But the stories are replete with really danger with respect to what my father was doing. He has landed an airplane that was on fire while he was at NASA. He bailed out of a fighter bomber right before he got selected as an astronaut when it was crashing on a runway. He flew three times on the space shuttle. One of his launch attempts, the engines were shut down and there was a fire on the pad, which when you're sitting on all those explosives is pretty scary. So he's used his nine lives up pretty darn quick and he's still going strong. Hopefully he doesn't template some more. As far as the themes that go, I think it is a, that idea that, Hey, there are people who sacrifice a lot for those who do things like this. I think people can relate that it often, I think is harder to see loved ones face danger than to do it yourself. And certainly that was the case, I think for me and my family, my father was doing what he was doing. And then the second theme that I hope people take away is you'll see in their real love for my father and a love for some of the things that he imparted to me, number one of which was curiosity about the world. 
he was always wondering about what was around the next bend and then talking about dinosaurs and always looking up and talking about the stars we saw and the satellites we saw going over. And that was a great gift to me. Very interesting. And the book also contains a share of technical language and you provide up front a list of acronyms and other terms, which is really important and helpful in the beginning. You also do a great job of describing engineering and scientific terms and activities using everyday language that otherwise would be difficult to understand for readers without a STEM background. How have you gone about translating, if you will, these terms into jargon-free, relatable descriptions? And maybe if you could describe your approach and any principles that you put to use here that you like to use in your everyday as well. Sure. First of all, I'm not sure I do as well as I could. I recently saw somebody I work with who read my book and said, she said something like, uh, all the space stuff was lost on me, but I love the story. So maybe I didn't do it as well as I thought. But obviously, if you want to appeal to a broad audience, it's pretty important not to go too deep into the weeds of really deep science and engineering. When I was writing the book, when I was describing a STEM-related thing, uh, an animation that might appear if anybody ever made a documentary about the specific topic I was discussing, and then describing what that animation would look like. It seems like a fairly circuitous route to get to where you need to go, but it works, it works for me. So a great example of that is if you ask people why astronauts are weightless, what do you think the number one answer is? It's that, oh, there's no gravity, which in fact, they're only weightless in a way because of gravity, which is that if you accelerate something parallel to the Earth's surface fast enough, it's going to always fall. But if you make it go so fast that the Earth is starting to curve away from it as it's falling, that's what makes you weightless. Describing that by talking about you know, somebody throwing a ball in a certain direction, they throw it faster and faster until eventually a reach or build velocity is the approach I took. And I can envision a cartoon of that in my head while I was writing it. The other thing that I learned, and I'm writing another book right now about learning to fly, and I found it actually more of an issue even in this book, is that you can't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. There's a real urge if you're a relatively technical person. I'm certainly less technical than a lot of your guests, but still there's an urge to go down the rabbit hole when it comes to explaining how every molecule might move over the wing of an airplane. And eventually I think you can lose readers and not achieve your objective. So I really make it a point to go back and read what I've written and say, hey, did I overreach here? And then scale it back a bit if it really gets to the point in fewer sentences with fewer technical terms. Both are just so helpful. I really like how you talk about what would the animation look like. I don't think that's a strategy that I've heard before. And as you're talking, of course, about the ball, I'm thinking about somebody out there just continually whipping, like windmilling the ball faster <laughs> and faster. So that's the animation that I'm thinking about in my head. What a great technique to follow as you're actually doing the writing. Many of us, myself included, really take technology for granted. We expect the mobile phone, Wi-Fi, microwave, streaming video, all these different things that we buy on, so to speak, to just work whenever we want them on demand. You and I had a chance to talk offline and you mentioned the idea of a tech freeloader as you referenced it. What do you mean by that? And what risk from your perspective do we want, do we run by not understanding even at a basic level how these ever-present devices and services work. Yeah, a tech freeloader. And I'll start by saying, first of all, at the risk, because um, I don't want to sound like I'm looking down on others. We're all tech freeloaders to some extent. There's nobody can know everything about every piece of technology you use. But I do think there is a bit of a, particularly in our modern times, a pandemic, if you will, of people just not having curiosity about the device they pick up and wondering why it might work. And obviously thinking about a phone here. I mentioned to you when we discussed earlier that I read a book about a guy who ended up on a capsized boat in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And he had a cell phone with him and was wondering why he couldn't get a signal from a satellite going overhead. And uh, for those who don't know, most cell phones are using cellular towers for their terrestrial base. So uh, if you're out in the middle of the ocean, you're not going to get a cell signal. And that really struck me as something like, how can somebody not know that? Now, again, that's a little unfair because a lot of people just don't stop and think about it. But I think it's really important that people do stop and think about it, even if you don't get the answer. And the reason I do is because it exercises your brain in a way that really drives home critical thinking, which is in such short supply everywhere in the world today, that I think we'd all be better off if there was this curiosity to let you say, I wonder how that works. And then 
use Google to find out if you're right or not. And you'll learn something doing that. And I do this pretty regularly. It's not something, again, that I do for every single technical device that I might use in a given day. But I do think that if everybody in the world did that a few times a week, we'd probably all be better off because of the ancillary effects we get from it, namely this critical thinking muscle being exercised. Thank you for underlining that. I recently was reading something talking about aging and both to your body and to internally with your brain. And that's one of the things that the article mentioned is the need for that kind of curiosity, learning new things, exercising your brain in certain ways like that, and really exploring these new topics. So thank you for that. I want to now turn to your career journey because you've had such an active and interesting career, as I described a little bit just in the intro. I'd love for you to share what is key assets that, that you have that have enabled you to be successful in all these diverse industries and most recently in an academic setting. Of course, critical thinking, we just <laughs> talked about that part, but maybe talk a little bit more about what specifically you mean by critical thinking and then any other sort of elements of your personal persona that you think have helped you make successful transitions as you really moved all around from industry to nonprofits in academia. First, with respect to the critical thinking, critical thinking to me is really what we learned in elementary school, maybe middle school or junior high school, but the idea of the scientific method, which is having a hypothesis, testing it. And then based on what you learn from the test, you adjust your hypothesis or you come to a conclusion and hopefully adjust your hypothesis. It strikes me the older I've gotten that that skill of critical thinking cannot be exercise or can even be present without curiosity. So fundamentally, I think that's a starting point. If you don't have curiosity about something, there's never going to be a reason for you to say, why is that way? And this, and this, by the way, covers all realms. It's not just science. It's certainly I would argue in politics today is that the idea that you hear what somebody says, you say, well, does that make sense? Yes or no. And, and you've worked in politics before. I think we can all agree on both sides of the aisle that, that often you're going to find people where, Hey, that, that there's not logic there. And so just being able to think it through makes you a better citizen, I think. And that, as we've already discussed, it makes you better when it comes to understanding the world around you. So I think that curiosity, which, as I mentioned earlier, my father instilled in me as a kid is really critical. And I, I wish more people had the benefit of having had a parent who would have instilled it in them. And I'd certainly encourage your listeners who are parents to do everything they can to be deliberate about instilling it in their children. Beyond that, that curiosity has obviously led me, as you noted, into a whole lot of different career tracks. And what's weird is even though the curiosity led me there in the end, success in them was always about the same thing. And if you're a leader, certainly it's about getting the people. If you have the right people in the right place, meaning right position in an organization and doing the right things, it does make everything so much easier. And I learned that early on, partly from, I think my time in the military, where by the way, I was managing a constellation of intelligence gathering satellites. So I got my first foray into STEM sort of stuff there in a big way. I think if you're going to be successful, at least when you're not an individual contributor, that's a big part of it. If you are an individual contributor, then I think that curiosity matters even more in some ways, because it's on you to make sure you're thinking about all the angles and the reasoning through the problems you face and solving them as you go. Thanks for that, Patrick. As we wrap up, I'd like to ask you, about your current role. You've recently returned to lead Harvard Business School Online in executive education as executive director. Could you share with us the value proposition of the online and exec ed offerings and also your vision for both of these sources of education? First of all, I do a lot of interviews with the press that focus on education. And I started my career at Harvard Business School just managing the online group and now have the broader responsibility of all non-degree stuff because we have pretty significant on-campus operations as well. But focusing on the online part first, when the pandemic was in full swing and I was asked questions, doesn't this mean that everything can be done remotely? I've always believed that the world of education is a blended world. It all depends on what your needs and objectives are and what's good for one person won't be good for another. So there's no pat answer to that question. That said, and getting to what I'd like to see us do at Harvard Business School in the groups that I manage, it's finding the right mix of modality. And by modality, you can have distance learning that's synchronous, meaning like you and I right now are at a distance, but we're talking to each other in real time or asynchronous, meaning there's a platform that's getting information to you as a student. And then there's on campus, obviously, and doing in-person things. So finding the right blend of all of those things in a way that A, advances learning and B, is meeting a market need, meaning you've got the right amount of stuff given how many people want that thing, I think is the critical factor. There has been a move in, in recent past, I think, and this is somebody else's term, not mine, but toward what he called just-in-time learning versus just-in-case learning. Just-in-time learning 
tends to be focused learning, often online, that will help you get information you need today to do something tomorrow. Just in case learning is much more traditional model for those who've gone to a four-year degree program, where you often study a broad range of topics. Like I took theology courses at Notre Dame when I was there, and I don't use theology very much, although it's been very helpful on Jeopardy, which I watch every night. So I do think there's a place for that, though. This idea of a whole person concept and getting a well-rounded liberal arts education, I think, can have great benefit. But again, what's good for me may not be good for somebody else. And so the best thing that's come out of the advent of technologies in education is that there's plenty of options, and you could choose what's right for you. So I'm very excited about what the future holds. And if I knew where it was going to go, I'd be a billionaire because I would buy all the stocks I know are going to go up. I don't, but I'm hoping to help shape it through my role at Harvard Business School. Absolutely. Pamela, thank you for that. And of course, we'll have a link to the Father, Son, and the Holy Shuttle in the show notes that accompany this episode. Thanks for sharing the, your broad perspective and talking about an experience that, as you pointed out, a very tiny fraction of the population on the planet really has ever experienced and how you've taken that and shared it with broad audience through your book and through the outreach that you do. And of course, the interviews that you do as well. Thanks for being here and also talking about HBS. Thanks very much, Mark. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. Listeners, thanks for being along on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.